Today is my particular pleasure to introduce the speaker for the CFA Colloquium, Professor Elena Gallo. Elena studied in Milan, in Italy, and then she obtained her PhD at the University of Amsterdam. After that, she was at the UC Santa Barbara and at the MIT as an Abbott Fellow, and she is currently a professor at the University of Michigan. Elena's current work is fundamental to shed light on the nature of low luminosity supermassive black holes in the nearby universe. And very notably, for example, she investigated the relationship between the energy entering stellar mass black holes from accretion of gas and the energy flowing out through collimated jets. So today she will be talking about the census of uh, black hole population in nearby low mass galaxies. So please, Helena, take it away. So hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to see, to read rather the names of so many familiar faces. It would be much nicer to be there and see you, uh, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so here I am. I'm going to talk about um, the low mass end of the massive black hole population in nearby galaxies. And uh, so here is a quick outline of my talk. Uh, first, I should mention, I made sure that I look back the last time I gave uh, the colloquium at the CFA was 2015, about five years ago. So I went back and made sure that there's not going to be too much overlap, even though the overall topic is pretty much the same. I'm going to focus on recent results over the last five years of, or so of myself and my group. Uh, in this area. So um, let's get started. I want to first give a broad uh, motivation for why characterizing the low mass end of the black hole, massive black hole mass function um, is a well uh, worth endeavor. So no modern um, <clears throat> black hole, massive black hole talk um, can get away these days without showing some version of this plot. So these are the well-known by now empirical scaling relations between black hole mass on the y-axis and some large scale property of its host galaxy. Here we have stellar velocity dispersion on the left and bulge mass on the right. And these uh, relations that have been known for now quite some time are generally interpreted as evidence for coevolution or in, in any uh, way evidence that the black hole can fundamentally affect properties of its host galaxies well beyond its sphere of influence. Um, so that, um, uh, that is interesting for a number of reasons. I'm going to focus on objects that have masses in terms of black hole masses lower than about 10 to the seven, 10 to the six, which means if you're looking at the right-hand side uh, of these um, two plots, so the right panel, um, galaxy stellar masses, total stellar masses lower than about 10 to the 10 solar masses. So in this regime, scaling relations are quite poorly characterized because it's extremely challenging observationally to get a handle on the presence or absence of a black hole, let alone measure their mass dynamically. Nevertheless, I'll argue that this regime is extremely important for a number of high stakes astrophysics problem. For example, um, this set of plots here from a very recent work that uh, compares different state-of-the-art um, numerical simulations for the coevolution of galaxies and their nuclear black holes. This is to illustrate, broadly speaking, how different recipes for the so-called subgrid physics, stuff that happens on scales that are not uh, resolved by these simulations. So therefore, where you need some sort of semi-analytical recipe for the physics, most notably of the black hole feedback. So different simulations yield quite different local um, black hole mass functions and local 
black hole host galaxy scaling relations, both at the high mass end, where actually this paper is focused, and the low mass end. So you're seeing here in different colors, different redshift uh, expectations, predictions from different uh, simulations. And here is log black hole mass as a function of host stellar mass. So different simulations don't, don't necessarily agree or match each other, let alone uh, the actual data, which I'm not showing here in this plot. I've chosen not to because I argue there is also a, an issue of potential bias in the um, data comparison, which kind of data one does select to plot against the simulations and whether there's biases in there. So even within um, an assumed relation, there are questions as to whether the local scaling relation um, holds down at the ma low mass end. This here is a plot taken from one of Fabio's works where it's showing in uh, dark blue, the um, measured uh, data, measured black hole masses. Now here is as a function of black uh, of, uh, stellar velocity dispersion for their biologists um, and their best fit line uh, in red, this is from a Van den Bosch et al. work, whereas his simulation is, is model rather semi-analytical model uh, predictions at the low mass end are shown in black and basically is arguing that if black holes undergo some somehow a um, bimodality in the efficiency of the accretion, whereby the low mass end below 10 to the five solar masses is very uh, poorly uh, very uh, has very low efficiency, then one would expect a departure from the extrapolation of the local scaling relation and the low mass end. And it's important to realize that here we have very little data to be able to even tell whether that is happening or not. Even worse, we might be fooled by selection biases into thinking that the data tend to, steep, tend to flatten as opposed to um, steepen. Changing gear, uh, but not less uh, interesting. Here is a, um, a couple of uh, plots taken from a paper by Stone and Metzger some five years ago now, which is showing how the local um, population of low mass black holes, and in particular the occupation fraction, which um, I will come back over and over again. So. When I talk about occupation fraction here, I mean the fraction of galaxies that host a black hole, a massive black hole at their center, regardless of whether we can probe accretion or um, its presence dynamically. So it's the true intrinsic occupation fraction. So the bottom um, plot here shows how for different values of the occupation probability, which is parameterized in the top panel as a function of black hole mass. So different colors and lines here correspond to different um, occupation probabilities from uh, very steeply declining at low masses to 100% occupation all the way essentially. These reflect into dramatically different expected rates, volumetric rates for tidal disruption events that are going to be detectable soon with LSST, as well as something similar has been shown um, for extreme mass ratio in spiral. These are gravitational wave sources that LISA is uh, supposed to be sensitive to. Mm, something that is most interesting to me personally is the notion or the idea that different, again, occupation fraction at, at the low mass end may discriminate, may be able to discriminate between different modes for seeding the progenitors of these massive black holes at redshifts of 10 and higher. So very broadly speaking, uh, the idea that one could discriminate between massive direct collapse seeds versus light pop three stellar mass type progenitors 
through a measurement or an inference of the occupational fraction in local dwarf galaxies. And shown here is um, <clears throat> a, um, a plot from a work by Riccardo and Natar Ayan, which shows again the occupation fraction now as a function of host stellar mass. So if you ignore everything else but the blue boxes here, these are the predictions in mass in three different mass bins for the host galaxy at redshift zero. And this is to illustrate that whereas um, for massive seeds, which is what is shown in this plot, the occupation fraction at high host stellar masses is 100% pretty much as uh, expected for uh, light seeds as well, because the accretion history and the merger history kind of erases memory of the, the progenitor at high masses. There's a different uh, prediction in that massive seeds are supposed to yield lower occupation fraction in local dwarf galaxies. These are effectively the conditions for forming a massive seeds are very ad hoc, very rare, require special angular momentum condition, irradiation to Lyman Werner um, field, and so on. So here the notion is that a local measurement could provide an orthogonal and perhaps even more unbiased way of differentiating between whether massive versus light seeds is the dominant seeding mode at high redshifts. And last, perhaps here is a bit more speculative, but interesting nevertheless. If, if black holes are ubiquitous in the low mass end of the galaxy mass function, as well as at the high mass end, then it's been suggested that their feedback in the form of outflows, essentially it's kinetic feedback from um, low level um, continuous jet-like outflows could actually dominate over supernovae in quenching star formation in dwarf galaxies too, not only as it is generally assumed, at the high mass end. This idea has been <clears throat> first um, put forward by Silk back, back uh, five years ago. And here you see kind of the latest incarnation of the uh, investigation, which argues that, that if, if indeed the occupation fraction is high and, and the low mass end, that could be the case. And so that would require a bit of a, um, uh, of a shift in our, um, paradigm around the, how feedback works from massive black holes in their galaxies. So with this, I hope I've, um, I've made a, um, a solid argument for why it is interesting to study and characterize the low mass end of the massive black hole population. At the same time, as I said, um, that this regime remains poorly characterized, and, and there are good reasons for that. So that's shown very uh, vividly, I think, in this nice um, graph that Jenny Green made for her um, white paper uh, for submitted for the Decadal Survey uh, a couple of years ago now. And it's showing, it's an, with an eye to the future, it's essentially showing what the next generation of ground-based optical telescopes equipped with Assisted, um, assisted with um, AO, ad ad um, adaptive optics, and IFUs will be able to do in terms of resolving the sphere of influence of this presumably small black hole in small galaxies. Even if uh, we are able, able to leverage the full you know, glass of two hemispheres of 30 meter uh, class telescopes, we are limited just by issues of resolution to exploring and perhaps measuring masses of something like 70 black holes within five megaparsecs. That is 20 years away. The current state-of-the-art type study, thanks to heroic effort with current eight, 10 meter class telescopes, basically has, has yielded a handful of measurements in terms of characterizing masses, measuring masses from dynamics. So this is basically telling you that 
the community for very good reasons have, has instead gone for the kind of less expensive in terms of telescope time and a and, uh, quick and dirty way, which is to look for active black holes in dwarf galaxies. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, going through some selected, so this is a biased selection of results that highlights some, um, some of the work by my own students and postdocs. But the underlying theme here is to give you a sense for how this has gone from a field where people go after individual interesting object to actual demographics. And even then we're just scraping the tip of the iceberg because the active fraction that's measured here is less than 1%. And not surprisingly, given that for a fixed uh, Eddington ratio, these small black holes are obviously much less luminous than their more massive counterparts. So we are limited to scraping just the tip of the iceberg. That said, um, after the pioneering works by Louis Hall, Jenny Green, some time ago now, uh, Amy Rines in 2013 did the first systematic study searching for AGN candidates in uh, SESS dwarf galaxies, whereby dwarf here, she set the threshold to stellar masses lower than 10 to the 9.5, that's about the Large Magellanic Cloud and identified starting with 25,000 objects in SDSS, something like 25 objects with broad H alpha emission. Um, and you can play the game of looking at the VTP diagrams and you know, identifying extra candidates. But the point here is that then it requires, even for an object with broad H alpha emission, because the velocities, the equivalent width are so low at the level of, six, seven, uh, 800 kilometers per second, you need to do follow-up spectroscopy with multi-epoch over many years. So you need to have, essentially you need to have uh, uh, some observations that are years old in order to do this. You need the baseline to confirm that this kind of width are not triggered by, caused by phenomena such as supernovae, something that is transient. And so, my, then my grad student, Vivian Baldassar, did a lot of uh, really interesting work in that, uh, in that respect. Back when I gave my last talk at the CFA, I think I flashed this result, which was then preliminary. So through her follow-up uh, spectroscopy work at Magellan, she was able to identify what back then was a bit of a record holder in terms of estimated black hole mass. So here through the so-called you know, single epoch <laughs> uh, varial product, i.e. by measuring the width, velocity and width of the H alpha, uh, broad H alpha component in this um, dwarf galaxy, RGG 118, um, she estimated a black hole mass of around 50,000 solar masses. Now, this, as I said, it's really, um, Quite heroic effort requires then in order to populate the M sigma follow up with eight 10 meter class telescopes. And so 10, sorry, five years later, uh, this is the latest incarnation of the black hole mass velocity dispersion plot. This was published by VVN about a year ago. Uh, and has added another handful of objects at the low mass end. The, the red points are from this latest uh, Baldassar et al. 2020. Um, the point being, as you can tell, you know, even five years later, we are making very little progress in terms of uh, populating the M sigma. Uh, I just want, similarly to what I did five years ago, I want to flash yet another perhaps record holder. This is work that uh, I've done in collaboration. This is a large collaboration between the University of Michigan through our uh, access to MDM, uh, University of California with LIC uh, access and um, the University of Seoul. And we are doing a large reverberation mapping campaign as, as part of this project, which actually targets the very high mass end of the distribution. 
ended up acquiring data for these uh, very nearby bulge-less dwarf galaxy, NGC 4395, the very well-known uh, local Seifert galaxy, for which a number of estimates in terms of um, central black hole mass existed in the literature, but with very large errors, and even a dynamical estimate um, had a large error due to the presence of a nuclear star cluster here. So long story short, um, I hope I'm not insulting anyone here, but just to remind you what the basics of reverberation mapping is, they're different conceptually uh, with respect to the methods, the virial estimates from um, uh, broad lines measurements. Uh, it's a very clever idea that goes back to the 80s, is that if one is able to measure a delay, a time delay, and the variability between the continuum emission in the optical, say, arising from the inner accretion disk, and the response to this variability, i.e. To res the response to a variation in the photoionizing flux, from the broad line region in the form of a variability in a line in an atomic transition produced there, that gives you a measure, the time delay can be translated into a measure of distance to the broad line region over radius. And that combined with the velocity dispersion for the gas in the broad line region gives you again a virial product, i.e. a mass. Um, I'm, I'm of course uh, trivializing this all, but uh, so we were able to get, we're lucky, I guess, to get an exceptional variability delay with a small, relatively small error of 80, about 80 minutes, which combined with a very high quality uh, spectrum at uh, Gemini with GMOS, heals again through the, the method I described, a mass of about 10,000 solar masses. Now. That's not necessarily the point. These obviously have um, relatively large errors, if nothing else, because of the uncertainty in the relative calibration of these virial products against the scaling relation. But letting that aside, the interesting thing here to notice is that once you plot this guy, this NGC 4395, again, on the local and sigma relation, which is done here, uh, the two measurements are for an upper limit in the stellar velocity dispersions and a measurement in the gas velocity dispersions at the bottom left. This guy appears not to lie particularly far from the extrapolation of the M sigma, which you might think is fine, but uh, the interesting thing to notice is that it has no bulge. It's a bulge-less galaxy. And so that, that's certainly, I don't want to overinterpret this in any way, uh, uh, shape or form, but it's certainly introducing sort of an extra dimension in this big puzzle of how to interpret this scaling relation and, and whether the causality is uh, particularly obvious. And I'll, I'll stop there as far as this goes. Back to sort of the big picture. Um, perhaps a sense for what the active fraction, the number of uh, dwarf galaxies that host AGN is, is, uh, is best given by this study by Mar Metzkua that looked at dwarfs in the Chandra Cosmos Legacy Survey and uh, essentially in um, up to Reshi 2.4 and concluded that the active fraction is less than 1%. Not surprisingly, perhaps. So again, here we are scraping the, the tip of the iceberg. It's exceptionally difficult to go to low Eddington ratios for these dwarfs. And that's because for the same Eddington ratio, their luminosity uh, is extremely low given the mass. So what I want to focus next, which is really the bulk of my talk as well as my work over the last five years, is how to convert a measurement of the local active fraction in low mass galaxies to an inference, statistical inference of the occupation fraction that goes well beyond the standard, the active fraction is a lower limit to the occupation, it's an upper limit to the occupation fraction. So as I mentioned already, one of the many reasons why 
measuring this quantity uh, can be interesting has to do with discriminating between different seeds. I will argue that short of a systematic survey with 30 meter class telescopes, which is 20 years away, the only way to do this to a reasonable precision is with high spatial resolution X-ray observations in the local universe and specifically Chandra, which is the only instrument with, with our sub arc second resolution and within about 30 megaparsecs. The distance limit is set by a combination of the PSF as well as considerations that have to do with contaminations to the nuclear X-ray signal from bright X-ray binaries, which I will not discuss in detail, but feel free to ask me if, you, uh, if you're interested. So, um, I will start to, uh, with a qualitative description of the method, which is really the key here. I will spend quite some time here um, to attempt to describe to you the power of this methodology, which was pioneered, which, which was um, laid out some five years ago in a, in a paper by Brenda Miller, myself, <clears throat> and others. So the ability to turn to translate occupation active fraction into occupation fraction <clears throat> hinges on the presence of a linear log log linear relation between nuclear x-ray luminosity so accretion powered x-ray luminosity from a nuclear massive black hole and the host galaxy stellar mass a relation that's linear in log log space with gaussian scatter so if you're looking at this <coughs> excuse me this sketch on the right focus on this light blue band um, and for the moment just that. So imagine that in the local universe there is a large scatter relation between nuclear X-ray luminosity and stellar mass. Now <clears throat> a known detection in X-rays could arise from either Insufficient sensitivity. So now if you're looking at this horizontal dashed line, imagine that you're operating at a fixed luminosity threshold. So it means you're adjusting the flux threshold with distance that can be done. An upper limit in X-ray can arise from either a point that belongs to the blue band below your sensitivity threshold or the fact that you have no black hole. So I'm going to show you how fitting simultaneously for the relations slope, intercept, and scatter together with the parametrization for the occupation fraction allows you to convert the detection fraction into occupation fraction, or better compare the number of detections and or upper limit to the expected number that are given by folding an occupation fraction parametrization with these measured relation. So I've given this kind of talk um, a sufficient number of times to know that by now usually people are, I don't see your eyes, but they're usually going in all directions. And this is my latest attempt to clarify what I mean by that, by that and hopefully it's going to be useful rather than even more confusing. So this is three panels. Um, we'll start with the top where what I'm showing is a simulated in the, uh, in the simplest um, um, way you can imagine, just a random generation of um, stellar masses. So the idea we have data with a given stellar mass distribution, galaxies with a given stellar mass distribution, <clears throat> and they generate 50,000 galaxies with the same stellar mass distribution. And this is shown in the top panel as the black line histogram, the histogram that is encompassing all these three colors. These are 50,000 galaxies with a given mass distribution. The next step is to populate them, these 50,000 galaxies with black holes according to different occupation probabilities. The analytic expression of the probability function is given at the top and it's shown in the middle panel. 
basically for this each value of this is one parameter function m star zero and the expression up there a, a given value of m star zero sets the occupation curve and it spans from the extreme case where there's effectively 100% occupation at the high mass end and then a rapid uh, decrease all the way to effectively, that's shown in red, say here, where there's 100%, um, sorry, in green, where there's 100% occupation all the way down to the low mass end versus the string case, the red one, where you have high occupation and then a drop. In this case, for this mass distribution, the red curve shows 12% occupation in galaxies with stellar mass lower than 10 to the 10 solar. So we're doing this for say 100 values of M star zero, which is to say 100 different curves of occupation. So 100 times 50,000 galaxies. Each time the galaxies that have a black hole are assigned an X-ray luminosity, which is drawn from the best fit relation, which you're seeing in the lowest, the bottom panel, and it's scattered. So for the, for the green curve that has basically 100% occupation across the mass scale, this is how our nuclear X-ray luminosity versus stellar mass of the host plane is populated. And everything that is above our sensitivity threshold shown by the dashed horizontal line and above the best fit relation in the solid, everything here ought to be detectable by Chandra. Okay. Everything that is not detectable is because it's below our sensitivity threshold. This is because every galaxy has a black hole. Now look at the data. Data here is for 200 objects and the stars show detections. The open symbols show limits, upper limits. Now by eye, this is a by eye exercise, okay? You could tell that, you know, this is not terribly different from the data. You could see a situation where, in other words, there's too little constraining power, too little information below 10 to the nine solar masses and stellar mass to be able to discriminate whether the upper limits are due to lack of black holes or just lack of sensitivity. Now we're moving to lower occupation fraction, 66% below 10 to the 10. This is now meaning that only these purple little points have black holes. Everything that is now in green has no black holes and therefore ought to be upper limits even above the sensitivity threshold. Again, there's too little discriminating power in the data to be able just by eye, okay, here to tell whether the detect that the upper limits are due to sensitivity or lack of a black hole. If we're pushing this to very low occupation, 12% occupation below 10 to the 10 solar masses, starting to see some hope right here because all the purple, all the green points in the LX and star plane ought to be upper limits. Now this is exaggerated by the fact there are 50,000 points, but if you look at the data, just 200 points, you're starting to see that maybe you have a sufficient number of discriminating power. You have a sufficient number of detections between 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10, to be able to tell that at such a low occupation is not perhaps consistent with the data. So this was a very qualitative uh, description. In reality, what we do is precisely did, we are fitting simultaneously for relation slope, scatter, intercept, as well as occupation parameterization in the form of this M star zero parameter, which defines the curves, to define the posterior distribution of each parameter. Now, back five years ago, this exercise applied to 200 early type galaxies within 15 megaparsecs, yielded somewhat modestly um, satisfactory constraints, 
in that we were able to constrain the occupation fraction, black hole occupation fraction below 10 to the 10 solar masses to higher than 30%, one sigma, and to you know, higher than 20% with high confidence, 95%. Now, the limitations of these are that we were focused on early types, and that has to do with dealing with contamination from high mass X-ray binaries, which we have now implemented, um, as well as the fact that simply there was too small of a sample in the mass range where we need more targets to be able to leverage the slope to constrain the occupation function. So I'm going to show you some progress from since. This is a paper together with uh, Alberto Cisana, now a couple of years old. This is essentially uh, leveraging the, all the suitable observations, Chandra observations on axis of, again, of early types within 15 megaparsecs. We are now at 330 objects, so it's about 50% larger sample. Not surprisingly, the constraints are not particularly um, better, but here you're seeing the plot of a posterior distribution of the occupation fraction on the y-axis as uh, versus posterior distribution of the slope of the luminosity stellar mass um, relation. The constraint here is higher than 45% occupation for masses lower than 10 to the 10 solar masses in host mass with 68% confidence. So there's some progress there. What I'm more excited to show you is this latest uh, set of results, which is still in preparation and preliminary. So, and, and by that, I mean that we are still, we are still in the process of finalizing the X-ray binary contamination assessment, assessment properly. Uh, nevertheless, 740 targets, Chandra on access data for early and late types within 30 megaparsecs, drawn from a new catalog of nearby galaxies that's been developed by Neil Sad and his students and myself. And here you have the, the, the latest results, occupation fraction for host stellar masses below 10 to the 10. Here's the posterior distribution shown against the previous bounds from a sample that was half the size. And we are now ruling out with high confidence, with 95% confidence, that the occupation fraction in this mass rate is lower than 50%. The median of the posterior distribution is at 90%. More interestingly, we are able for the first time to put some constraints on the occupation below 10 to the nine solar masses. So this is bona fide dwarf galaxy regime. And you're seeing here how the distribution stretches because we are less constrained in power in this mass range. Nevertheless, Occupations lower than about 25% are ruled out with high confidence, and the, ever, the median of the distribution is 80%. So this is where we stand as of today. Spend uh, some um, couple minutes showing you how realistically one can um, improve upon this. Um, so. Of course, you can always gather, you know, get more data. And in fact, I would argue that a dedicated survey of dwarf galaxies, even with Chandra, can get to 15% precision. But aside from that, looking ahead, looking at the future, this approach can obviously be generalized uh, to predictions for measuring the occupation fraction. We've done that in a paper with Edmund Hodges Clark uh, uh, that was meant to assess the potential of a Chandra successor mission for this specific type of measurement. And the conclusion from that exercise is, of course, the answer depends on the actual true occupation fraction as well as detection fraction. Um, but it, it will take of the order of 3000 galaxies, 1000 in the best case scenario, depending on the actual occupation fraction within 100 megaparsecs with a Lynx class mission to achieve 5% precision in occupation fraction 
in 0.5 dex mass beings within between 10 to the eight and 9.5 solar masses. Uh, now, this may seem um, optimistic, <laughs> it is, but, but as I said, uh, I believe this is short of a dedicated survey in both hemispheres with ELTs, um, maybe the only realistic uh, venue to, um, to achieve this kind of measure. The last thing I want to flash, it's more of, a, um, of an exercise rather than an actual claim that we have any handle on the black hole mass function below 10 to the six solar masses. Now I'm talking about black hole mass. Uh, but this is just to highlight how incorporating constraints uh, to the black hole occupation fraction into this um, inference can actually change the shape of the mass function. So this work, uh, this was um, part of the paper with uh, Alberto Cezanne a couple of years ago, not surprisingly with, with uh, Alberto being involved was somehow motivated by improving the constraints to um, a, a particular type of events, namely extreme mass ratio in spirals. Uh, around intermediate low mass, massive black holes. These kind of events will be detectable by the um, Space Gravitational Wave Mission, uh, LISA, with high signal to noise ratio, but the, the volumetric rates are highly sensitive to the mass function in the, uh, in the mass range below 10 to the six solar masses, not surprisingly. So just a prime, uh, primer of you know, black hole mass function 101. Um, here is, is, a, a, is a plot taken from a, um, a nice review by Shankar a few years ago. This is to illustrate that typically the way to go about inf inferring the black hole mass function is to take the um, some known or um, assumed scaling relation of black hole mass with some other um, parameter y of the host galaxy, say stellar mass or stellar velocity dispersion, and consider the intercept scatter and slope of that uh, relation. So here's um, the parameters alpha, beta, eta, uh, and then convolve that with say in the case of a stellar mass relation, the stellar mass function of the host. Now this plot illustrates how dramatically sensitive the output black hole mass function, number of number density of black holes per unit co-moving megaparsecs, okay, is to the actual choice of the scaling relation, which is problematic to start with. On top of this, every single exercise here, uh, every single function out there assumes 100% of occupation, which is, which is justified in the mass regime that we're looking at here. But if the occupation fraction were to dive at lower masses, they would, this would introduce yet another term in the expression for the mass function. Uh, and so we've parameterized in that work, the mass function as before, but adding the term, the occupation probability lambda to the integral effectively. So in that work specifically, we have chosen stellar mass of the host as the um, sort of the link between black hole and galaxy mass function that enables us to use the latest uh, gamma mass function, which is complete down to dwarf regime, 10 to the 7.5 solar masses. For scaling relation, we are purposely choosing a very large scatter relation, which is the one <clears throat> identified by Rhines and Voluntary for a sample of AGN and quiescent galaxies, which they're on at their selection biases. But the idea here is that by account by, by including such a large scatter, we are likely to encompass all the uncertainties that are embedded into other relations, even though they, those may be intrinsically more reliable. Long story short, 
here is the gamma mass function just for long story short so now when we parameterize the occupation fraction in the same way as I discussed before, here I'm showing the posterior distribution for the M star zero parameter, which then given the mass distribution of the sample translates into occupation. Um, this has not surprisingly sort of a downturn effect into the output mass function, which is shown here in yellow. So what you're looking at here is the extension of the mass function below black hole masses of 1 million, 10 to the six solar masses in yellow. These are 95 and 65% contours in um, light and dark yellow, respectively, plotted against the hashed red and hashed green are Shankar's um, black hole mass functions using different scaling relations, stellar velocity versus stellar mass. And what's interesting, even though this is certainly not particularly um, pleasing, and there is still a huge uncertainty there, but notice that the LISA community for the purpose of, of predicting MRI extreme mass ratio in spiral events rate, they're bracketing the black hole mass function below 10 to the six solar masses with these two dashed lines. These are curves that come from Geir et al. This is an analytic prescription. It's sort of the most pessimistic thing you can think of without violating anything. <laughs> and the top one is from a semi-analytical work by Barossi. So this is just to say how incredibly large the parameter space that's considered is as of now for the purpose of estimating event rates. Even just this simple exercise has reduced the bands, uh, the error bands substantially modulo. Of course, there is uncertainty in the choice of the scaling relation. But what is perhaps more interesting is that with a Lynx class mission and thousands of galaxies and a, a better uh, a higher precision occupation fraction. This is how the, the uncertainties in the low mass end of the black hole mass function could shrink to the level of actually um, having a factor two normalization uncertainty, 65% confidence as, you know, versus the orders of magnitude that are, um, that, uh, that is currently um, bracketed by. So I think I'm leaving you with this summary. It's very simple. So I've shown you some recent and improved Chandra-based uh, constraint to the local black hole occupation fraction in low mass galaxy and how it could possibly impact the black hole mass function, let alone um, impact uh, tangentially many other areas of astrophysics, including the topic of black hole seeding at high redshift. So um, modulo that we need to revise, in fact, uh, complete uh, a proper X-ray binary contamination for this sample of 700 and about 40 galaxies uh, between late and early types. The, the latest results constrain the occupation in the true dwarf galaxy regime, that is stellar masses lower than 10 to the nine solar masses, solar should be that, sorry, uh, to higher than about 25% with very high confidence. Um, and that I don't, I'm not a theorist, nor uh, should I pretend to be one, but certainly, so there is no upper bound, both the, the constraints uh, below 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10 solar masses are both consistent with 100% occupation, which at the zeroth order seems to be more in line with light seeds, a pro a predominantly light seeding moles. Um, to improve upon this at the level of 5% precision in 0.5 dex mass beams, um, 
one would need a Lynx class mission for a more modest but still uh, interesting improvements at the level of 10, 15% precision, a dedicated Chandra survey of dwarfs would do. Uh, and short of both, we are gonna have to wait for another 15, 20 years um, for uh, ELTs to survey more than you know, the, the, all the, the small, gal small mass galaxies within five megaparsecs and, and give us not only an answer on the occupation, but actual uh, black hole masses. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for a very interesting and exciting colloquium. And we have time for questions. Igor was waiting already, so please go ahead. Uh, hi, Elena. Thanks for the hi. talk. It was quite interesting. So there's a lot of a lot to ask, but I'll ask two short questions. Yeah. So first of all, the black hole masses, because it's all about the beginning of the talk, not the um, uh, not the phenomenological part related to uh, occupation fractions. So no later than yesterday, we received a rejection from JWST saying that oh, your viral black hole mass estimates is rubbish. Uh, there is no question, there is nothing to discuss here. And so uh, here, uh, if you look at the NGC 4395, its virial uh, single epoch mass estimate is consistent with Peterson's values around two times 10 to the five. So do you believe in the 10 to the, uh, 10 to the four solar mass in 4395? Or do you believe in all the rest of the IMBH work starting from Green and Ho going to Green and Ho going to um, Rhines, and, uh, Rhines and Green and uh, Vivian Baldassari and so on? Because those are inconsistent with each other. It's a factor of 20 difference in the virial mass that is off if you believe the 10 to the 4. And my second question is about the dwarf galaxies, uh, uh, like the scale and relations. Uh, this is your third slide here. So um, uh, I gave a talk uh, at a conference in December, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, a few months ago in December on supermassive black holes. And we were like, there were many people there from the IMBH community. And there was this uh, result presented by Vivian on the low mass extension of the um, uh, scaling relations. And I presented my version, which is still unpublished because we're collecting the data, but it, it looks like there are lots of outliers and lots of outliers to the uh, bottom part of the relation. So you have big galaxies with small black holes. If you, again, if you believe in virial mass estimates, uh, which suggests you that uh, there might be like either the growth is dominated not by mergers or by something else. So there's a, a there's a, uh, a discordance in the evolution between in the coevolution between black holes and host galaxies. But it turned out that people are uh, this idea of scaling relations is so much so much imprinted in people's minds they, they don't believe that this thing exists. Because if you look for things in dwarf galaxies and you discover low mass black holes in dwarf galaxies, you automatically confirm the correlation just because you didn't look in this corner of the relation. So what would be your take on these two points? Uh, okay, so let me start with your second, the latter point. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, so if I understand correctly, you're asking, it's, your question is more of a, uh, asking an opinion on where things stand on the scale of relations. Is that correct? I mean, yes. I and uh, how about the, uh, uh, how about the outliers to the larger, to more, ma to massive galaxies with smaller black holes? Massive galaxies with smaller with black small holes. black holes, yes. Like um, ten to the eleven uh, solar mass with ten to the six black hole, like Milky Way. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the Milky Way, just to give that example, I mean, it's routinely shown in these plots, and mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I, I, no, I don't think anyone considers it an outlier. 
right? I mean, I, I don't know if you're if you're referring to lower um, lower gal lower mass galaxies and that regime and or data that you said you haven't published. Higher mass galaxies, lower mass black holes. Yes. Higher mass galaxies, lower mass black holes. Um, I, I'm not sure which kind. I mean, I haven't seen the specific results you have in mind, but I am not particularly surprised of um, there being a huge scatter. I was scrolling to my um, slides to put up the uh, Ryan's involuntary. Uh, am I still sharing my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, what you are seeing here. Uh, of course, there's a collection of different methods for measuring masses, and uh, this is a, a, a quite a, a busy plot. But one thing that is pretty obvious is that there seems to be a fairly systematic offset in terms of where, in, in terms of having lower black hole masses for a given host stellar mass of the active objects. Right? You're seeing all mm -hmm. this. This, these little um, red points are uh, broad line AGN. Now that, that kind of feeds into your previous question and whether or not you trust those masses, but that letting, setting that aside for the moment, um, you know, you're seeing this is M black hole mass to stellar mass relation. People have argued this is it's got a lower, a larger scatter than stellar velocity dispersions, but nevertheless, um, it is a, a huge scatter. It could be explained in terms of different evolutionary paths and accretion uh, histories and mergers having played a role in uh, recent in the recent past of one class versus the other. But um, if your point is that there is enormous scatter to this relation and that people are now so kind of obsessed with the there being a fundamental scaling and the interpretation of that uh, having to do with feedback. You know, all, all the things that we've been telling each other for 10 years, I, I agree that the story is likely much more complicated and, and, and down at the low mass end, there's, I'm sure there's people in the audience, Fabio to start with, that can give a much more uh, intelligent answer here, but there's all sorts of uh, theoretical works that uh, expects deviation from this large scatter already as is relation at the low mass end in all possible ways, by the way, above <laughs> or below. Um, so, so let me just conclude. I think if you're, if, does that some somehow uh, answer your question or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yes. okay. okay. So then the first one was more specific to um, to the zero mass, black hole masses. Yes, the zero black hole masses. So, um, so you started by saying. Um, so, so your question, if I remember correctly, ha is essentially, do you believe one or the other? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah. for 4395, the effect of 20 difference, 20, not two, as it's claimed. Yeah. yeah. So in, when you say factor of 20, you're talking about the mass estimated with reverberation mapping. Uh, with reverberation mapping uh, by the Korean team, uh, this one, the one that you shown, uh, yeah. compared to the, if you just take the virial calibration and take an optical spectrum and measure broad line of H alpha, you get 2.5, 10 to the 5. And this is consistent with also with Peterson's old reverberation. Okay. So, um... So this, in, in the paper, the Wu paper, the Korean group that I'm involved with, uh, there's a, in, in the methods, there's, there's a discussion about this. So to answer, um, I believe, or rather would think this latest measurement with the GMOS spectrum is more reliable. And the reason is that briefly, um, when you look at the Patterson uh, campaign, and their reverberation mapping um, and the reverberation mapping uh, result. Actually, what you find is that the time delay, so in the in the virial ratio, obviously you have the delay and the radius, the time delay, even though they have 
quite a larger error. So they have, you know, their, their Fourier analysis yields a larger error on the delay. It's consistent with this 80 minutes with a large error. What is uh, the, the root of the difference is in the stellar velocity dispersion measurement. Now we have um, really high quality data with GMOS uh, and we are estimating 426 kilometers per second with a really small error. The resolution, you know, considering seeing and everything at the time of the observation was 45 kilometers per second. Um, so there's no doubt we are able, you know, that this is well beyond. Um, the Patterson result, first of all, um, they were using, uh, this is hydrogen um, H alpha, that one uh, was, if I'm not mistaken, carbon, but that's not the point. So in that- C4, C4, yes, uh, right. in the UV. But, but, but that's not my point. So. If you look at the literature here, uh, it really, I think, depends on what the me what method you use to uh, fit or what do you choose for your velocity dispersion, i.e. the broad component of the Gaussian af after you have subtracted the narrow uh, component of the line and accounted for the blue wings, which is what we did in this case by, um, um, by um, using the silicon line, which is unresolved as a template, or some others use full width of maximum. Some others use the second momentum of the line, the RMS of the line. So there is a surprisingly, I was not aware of this when I dug into reverberation mapping studies, there's a surprisingly level of deshomogeneity in the method that's, um, that's, as, that's employed for defining velocity dispersion. If I'm not mistaken, Patterson uses full width of maximum, which I don't believe is the correct way to do it because you need first, you, know, you need to take off the narrow component that is probably embedded in the narrow line regions, focus on the, focus on the broad component, the one that's presumably virialized in the, uh, you know, in the black hole gravitational field. Um, and the, interestingly, if we use our line and do use their method with the full width of maximum, we actually get a result consistent with this. I just don't believe that's the right way to do it. However, I'm, I, I think your question was not about inconsistency with pattern. Was it about inconsistency? It's with about pattern? inconsistency with virial black hole mass. With virial. So now you're talking about a different thing, right? You're talking about yeah, sure. the so-called single epoch, which yeah. means just take the H alpha, Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, H alpha or H beta, whatever. Yeah. H alpha or H beta, okay. And uh, so from that you measure both, essentially the velocity and uh, the radius through the radius luminosity relation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, okay. Yeah. So I think these methods, even though you know I myself was involved in, in many of these studies is Certainly, I, I would I would think less reliable than reverberation mapping. Granted that both need to be scaled to local scaling relation via the you know the F factor, the the sort of how do you call it the virial uh, factor, the one that accounts for geometry and and um, and inclination. But that's a problem for both methods, so that's not at the origin of the discrepancy. So back to your question. Um, the single epoch measurement for this guy, uh, I, I don't recall on top of my head the actual paper and the details. I would think that um, if a proper fitting is done and with the same method for defining what the velocity is, okay, and so uh, this goes back to using the full width of maximum or the weight of the Gaussian or the second momentum and so on, they ought to be consistent. But not since I don't recall the single epoch reverberation measurement uh, for this object, I cannot comment specifically. Um, yeah. Okay, it is anyway, you. it's a that one that you're referring to, even though it's widely adopted and cheap in terms of uh, telescope time. Okay. 
it is a tertiary method because it's calibrated upon empirical scaling relations that are established for truly reverberation mapped objects through the radius luminosity relations. So by definition, ought, it ought to be a less reliable method. I'll stop here, I think. I'm, I'm yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we have two more questions. One from Pepe, please go ahead. Um, uh, hi. <laughs> All right, so I had two questions, but uh, I can be quick. Um, one has to do with the estimate of the XRBs and how much uncertainty that can bring to your results. And the other one, can you increase your sensitivity by using stacking? You know, stacking your sample in uh, stellar mass ranges. In bins, stellar mass bins, like something oh. like a bit. The second question, I have to make a confession. I don't know if I told you this already. Usually when I start to, you know, two months before a deadline, I start to think about, you know, coming up with something interesting. And I, I think I found a new idea. Then I go look the literature and you have done it five or 10 years <laughs> earlier. And so uh, when you said that, I was like, no, I never, I never thought of that. And, why so the answer is no and it's a really good idea and why did i not think of it i will do it the first question the first question um i did i i, I did not i chose not to enter into the details here because this is already dan says he's so i, I thought you know that not to <laughs> overload it so the X-ray binary contamination, as you know very well, uh, the luminosity functions are now well known. Uh, I refer in, in the way we that uh, the way we account for it is to consider. First of all, we focus on on-axis observations alone, so that the PSF is sharp. And then within the, say, 95% encircled energy radius of a for a given detection, need to give an estimate of the enclosed within the PSF, within the 90%, 95% encircled radius, the, the enclosed stellar mass and star formation rate, estimate the probability of contamination from low slash high mass X-ray binaries. Okay, and using Lemmer's latest subgalactic modeling uh, recipe. Now that is all well and fine, and you know the the, the Lemmer's latest work um, uh, offer uh, really a tool for doing this, provided that you have a decent estimate of this quantity, star formation rate and mass, which is gets more complicated, the more heterogeneous the sample is, as in you have SDSS, SDSS data for some and you don't for others. And that's why we've not completed this task for the larger sample. As to the errors, so on a case by case basis, you give me galaxy X has a detection with a given X-ray luminosity, um, uh, I cannot give you, unless it's a, it's a non-AGN with luminosity of 10 to the 43, in which case no, no binary can do it, but you know, you know that. But uh, you know, for something that is borderline at 10 to the 38.5 uh, luminosity, it's impossible to tell on a case by case basis, whether it's a low luminosity AGN or a binary. But statistically, one can take this sample and uh, and and do it um, from, you know, a, a statistical. <laughs> here is where she comes <laughs> from a statistical um, a, 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 from a statistical ensemble by treating each um, each detection uh, iteratively with an assigned probability, say a detection as an assigned probability of say being 50% an X-ray binary versus an AGN, then we fit the entire ensemble 
500 times, varying probabilistically the weight of each detection according to the contamination probability. That's okay. The last bit is uh, perhaps, I don't know which angle are you thinking of. I'm probably going to be, um, I'm, I'm probably missing it, but the last one bit that um, may be problematic is that dwarfs, there's an issue of metallicity, right? That going down the mass function, metal, the, the, there's a metallicity effect and the, this latest uh, work by Lemmer again, uh, that looks at particularly the high mass X-ray binary luminosity function over these, fifth, I think it's a sample of 55 objects. It's, it's really showing this effect of an increase in the luminosity and number of objects above the identical limit for a stellar mass for lower metallicities. And this is not something we've implemented, but it is doable. It's just a um, tedious machinery. I think it is tractable as a problem. But it's important to put it there. Oh, very. Yeah, no, no, no. That's in fact, it's. I, I tend to gloss over it, um, but uh, unless someone like more in the know asks, but it is a, a key component of the analysis because perhaps I should have stressed that typically we are operating a sensitivity threshold that are close to a stellar mass object. So it is absolutely. In, it's fundamental, this entire machinery would collapse if we did not properly account for, for that. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we have a last question from um, on the chat from Steve Wilner. So he's asking, any chance of detecting black holes in low mass galaxies by transient gravitational lensing? Um. <laughs> I don't, my gut sense is that the interplay of you know, lensing is a geometrical effect. So you know, what matters is the mass of the lens, the mass of the object that's being lensed, the relative distance. And my sense is probably that for you know, a local, local universe, low mass, massive black holes, uh, the, the, the combination of these variables is not, is not such that it would be detectable, but I am confident someone else in the audience knows, knows much more and much better. And uh, I'm not sure, that would be my instinct answer, but it's not grounded in actual knowledge. All right, so I don't see any more questions. So let's thank our speaker again for an excellent colloquium and uh, we thank will you. see you all next I week. I hope to see you in person next time. Yes. And good night. <laughs> good night.